Happy Mother's Day. There you go. Yeah. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to New Hope Christian Fellowship. God is good. And all the time. And that'll never get old. I don't care who you are. First of all, what I'd like to do is open in prayer. And as most of you know, we had a, a brother who was, took ill this morning. And he's now being taken care of by the, by the professionals. Thank God for that. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we do thank you for this opportunity to come before you. We lift up our brother Harold Bell right now, who is this hauled off to the emergency room for whatever purpose, whatever it is, Lord God, we know that your hand is in it and you're taking care of him. We pray that he can be a witness unto you as he's uh, um, <clears throat> in this place. I uh, pray for the paramedics and we give you thanks and praise for medical personnel and for emergency services to to help us in time of need, Lord. Um, we also, Lord God, lift up the prayer list that we have in our bulletin on the back page and, and all the prayers, as Tammy mentioned this morning, for those that are silent, that haven't really spoken up because we think they might be so insignificant. But you, Father God, for us, everything matters. Everything matters to you because of your love and care and kindness for us that we can share that love with one another. Again, we thank you. We love you and we praise you. Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, I said Holy Spirit, come, but I think we already know he's here, right? Amen. Amen. Um, I think the guys covered all that bulletin real well. That was good. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Plumbers are a very nice family. Good people. So, Mother's Day. Why do we celebrate Mother's Day? Now, all the moms can probably speak up and say something, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know, this was a holiday that was started back in on uh, 1914. Okay, or actually, Anna Jarvis in 1908 became an official U.S. holiday Mother's Day in 1914. But you know that she, later on she denounced it and tried to do away with it and tried to sue people that were promoting it because it became one of the number one holidays in America. More money was spent on Mother's Day at any other time. And even today, do you know that the phone system is jammed up because it is the most popular day to call mom. Everybody's calling mom or texting mom, okay? And sometimes you get a little frustrated, especially now that we have this text message thing, okay? And you can ask Tammy. Uh, she's back there in the kitchen or doing her thing, you know, my, our little mouse, she's doing her job. Oh. <laughs> this morning as I'm sitting in my office and I'm, uh, preparing the sermon and message for today, my phone started going off. And I changed the ringtone, by the way. It doesn't say, woohoo, text message. It says, our God is an awesome God. And it, it, click. Our God is an awesome. Click. Our God is. Click. Our God. It was my family, you know, I got six brothers and two sisters and they're all on this, we're all on this big message, you know, you send it once and then everybody gets it and everybody replies and, and you know, that's part of the reason why we don't have to reply to that, uh, the uh, prayer chain, right Kathy? Because <laughs> the phones just go boom and he goes <laughs> down the hallway and the dogs go. <laughs> Mother's Day. Mother's Day, huh? You know, even today, almost every country in the world observes some sort of a version of Mother's Day to thank mothers for their critical role that they play in the family. But I think I want to make a change and call it Mom's Day because I don't call my mother, Mother. <laughs> when you say, Happy Mother's Day, Mom, right? When you call her up, it's always mom. I hear the kids when they call Tammy and she puts it on, hi mom. It's never mother's. But you know what? I, I think there's a significance to that. 
because you know a mother is is a mother of a child but to be a mom it takes special skills you know just like we saw in that little circle there on the video this morning it takes skills to whip out a tissue out of nowhere <laughs> that you you know right and the one thing i hated is if i had hair out of place yeah. <laughs> oh god <laughs> <laughs> You're sitting in the wrong place, Rob. <laughs> yeah. But the duty of a mom is just amazing. You know, we always say, hi, mom, you know. And, and I'm not saying everybody calls their mother mom. You know, you come call her ma. I call my mother-in-law ma. Hey, ma. You know. I wonder what Jesus called his mother. Yeah, see, we're, 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 yeah, we're thinking too, right? We're, hmm. Did he call her mother? Did he call her mom? Did he call her ma? Woman? You know, that is the most respectful way to address your mother, your sister, your friend, is woman. Because that's whole. That means you're the, the bearer of my children if I say that to my wife. If I say that to the, my mother, that is just, you know, and Jesus in John chapter 19 called his mother woman. And you know, how did Jesus love his mother? He loved her so much. You know, in the Jewish culture, if a mother was without a husband or the oldest son, she was on her own. And usually went by the wayside. But Jesus loved his mother so much that he, in the word, says a few words to his mother and his best friend. John chapter 19, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your son your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So Jesus loved his mom so much that he gave somebody else charge to, so that she wouldn't fall by the wayside and become a widow out there with nothing. Because in that Jewish culture, they would lose the house, they'd lose it all generally. If they didn't have a job, if they didn't have a male figure in the household. So Jesus loved his mother so much that he appointed someone, his best friend, to take care of her. No matter where we are in our lives, we must understand this one thing. If Jesus held his mother in high standards, shouldn't we do the same? As a matter of fact, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Did you know that? It's the only commandment with a promise. We went over that commandment this morning in the youth class. If you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Excuse me, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. Some of you might have it memorized. Come on, where'd it go? Keep, there we go. It says, in the New King James Version, okay, read along with me as best you can. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So we are to honor our mother and our father, which is the first commandment with a promise. And these were out of the ten suggestions in the Old Testament. Did you get that? Yeah. No, there are Ten Commandments. They weren't, yeah. Everybody's going like, that's not what it says. <laughs> right? The Ten Commandments, out of the Ten Commandments, this is a command that we love our parents, that we love our mom. Is that a contract? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, let's not take advantage of our moms, our mothers, our wives, sisters, the mother of our children. But let us esteem them as God intended. Men, we've been given a commandment too. And it remains, this remain here in the book of Ephesians, but let's back up a few verses. Let's look at verse 25 of the fifth chapter. Because men, these women, are our wives, are the mothers of our children. They're the grandmothers to our grandchildren. Verse 25 of 5, it says, Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. We'll continue on into verse 33 here. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Wow, that's a lot. So men, we are to love our wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He didn't give 10%. He didn't give 30%. He didn't give 50%. He didn't give 5 He didn't give 95 My word says he gave it all. He gave all to the church, just like we must give ourselves to the church and give ourselves and love our wives like Jesus loves the church so that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of waters. You know... <laughs> We sometimes take it so lightly, even, even, in, when, even when we were kids, you know, and, and there were uh, uh, attractions going on, and we see all this stuff happening even in our youth, you know, and we jokingly play about it, you know, and, uh, and we, we, we come together, we're on the playground, for example, you know, and we're going, 
Uh, Jim and Tammy sitting in a tree. K I S S I N G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a little bitty baby in a carriage. Or however you want to say it, or junior, or whatever, you know? Right? And then that's what we think. That's how it's going to go. And then we live happily ever after. Sign on the dotted line, Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Sign on the dotted line. When we sign something, we believe that's a contract. Is it a contract? Or is it, or is it a covenant? Ooh. Big difference. Big difference. So a contract, covenant. Hmm. What's the definition? Do we know what the definition is? I could just sum it up in a few words so I don't get into the Britannica. <laughs> or Webster's, okay? A contract is something that you would uh, pin up together, that you would make an agreement on, and if uh, by any way that somebody would uh, um, come short of the contract, and we can void the contract, and we're out of here, right? My word says... Let no man put asunder what God has joined together. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. That's where it says it. And I'm going to the Word so that you know that I'm not saying that I said that he said that he said that she said. Chapter 10, Mark. Verse 1. I'm going to read 1 through 9. Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan, and multitudes, multitudes gathered to him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. He answered and said to them, Why did Moses command you? What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation... God made them male and female. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. So we get married in the eyes of God, and then we go to man in the courts of man to get a divorce. Whoops. Is that loving God like God loves the church? Like Jesus loved the church? Is that loving your wife like Christ loved the church? You know, we make a covenant. Covenant is, is an oath. And generally it's one-sided. I made an oath. I made a vow. To love my wife and to carry her healthy, sick, it doesn't matter, all the way till death do us part. That's a covenant. It's not a contract. We didn't come together and say, okay, uh, we're going to uh, come together here and if we get a divorce, you get the house, I get the kids, and we're going to sign this contract. So if it ever fails, this is what happens. That's not how Jesus loved the church. He gave it all. So, And that's the covenant that God gave man from the beginning. In the beginning, God... God made an Abrahamic covenant. He made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with David. We, gentlemen, are to love our wives like Jesus loves the church. We've been studying on relationships for the last week, and then this is the second week, and this is about moms and about wives and about what we are supposed to do. Next week, ladies, your turn. <laughs> because God commands us both. 
He commands us all. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your strength. That is the one foremost commandment of all. And if we did that commandment, we wouldn't have to deal with the other ten. Because if you loved like God loves, you wouldn't covet. You wouldn't murder. You wouldn't steal. Right? Right? So with our relationships, last week we talked about relationships in general, about our neighbors and our friends. And Jesus said that we would be witnesses of Him to them. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That we're to go and do that. And we as Christians, we're, we're supposed to go out and give witness to love our friends and our neighbors. Now let's get a little bit closer to home where it begins. And where it begins is with each person individually making a covenant. If I'm not right with God, how can I help my wife? If she's not right with God, how can she help me? I make a covenant with God to my wife. I have to live up to my side. No matter what happens. You know, no matter what happens. Okay, and she makes that same covenant, but I can't tell her. Do you need to make? Uh, uh, hey. Yeah, that's what it says. No, in love, as Jesus loved the church, who gave Himself for the church, as we love ourselves. We must love our wives. We must. I mean, I, I, I married Tammy for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. You know, it's like Fred said, you know, she's still waiting for the money to come in. <laughs> Where would you be? Just think about this. Where would we be right now if Jesus changed his mind? Where would we be right now if Jesus changed his mind and did not go to the cross? He loves us that much. I couldn't imagine. And I thank God I'm born in this time for this period right here, right now. Because if I was back then, I'd have probably been like the rest of the gang when they came into the garden. <laughs> they disappeared, ran away, took off, gone. Pfft, I'm out of here, man. Swords are drawn. Woo. I'm a fisherman. I'm, not, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I'm out of here. But could you imagine what the world would be like today? If Jesus didn't go to the cross. If Jesus didn't love us that much. And that's the kind of love that he's talking about. He created you. In his image. And to me image is. If I would look in the mirror. And see an image of me. That air mirror image doesn't have the same power that I do. But it sure has the same vision. The same visual. All that good stuff. And everything that I do it can mimic. Right? Right? But I'm not the image in the mirror. The, mirror. the image in the mirror is not me. Does that make sense to you? It's God says that we are created in His image. So we're just a perfect reflection of Him. A reflection of Him. We're a reflection of that light. We're a reflection of that salt. Everything that He does, we can mirror. How He loves, we can love. Jesus says, you can do greater things than I. In John. Because we're still here. We're still continuing on. We're moving forward in this. Because He gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit indwells in us. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. And if you don't quite understand that, see me after church. I'm always hungry. Lunch. 
dinner, ice cream. As long as it's sugar free, right, Trent? Relationships. Husbands, love your wives as Jesus loves the church. Children, obey and honor your parents. Honor your dad and your mom. That's what I call them. You know, we get Father's Day is coming up next month, and, and I'm going to say it's called Dad's Day. Because I never called my father father. I call him dad. I call him pops. Paul writes and says that he holds us holy and blameless before the foundation of the world. That God holds us holy and blameless before the foundation of the world. He laid down his life for us, for the church, for the body. And he's the head of the church, the head of the body. And this is how he loved us. Before the foundation, you know, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, we can just, I'm just going to summarize it here, just give you a little uh, uh, paraphrase or, or a commentary, however you want to call it. Before the foundation of the world, God holds you holy and blameless before Him through the works of His Son, Jesus Christ, because He loves us. But you got to believe in Him, in Jesus Christ. You got to believe. Believe in Jesus. And again, I say to this to us in this church men, love your mothers. Like Jesus loved John. Like Jesus loved his mother. Love your wives. Especially, especially who are mothers of your children. Or even potential mothers. Potential mothers, yeah. The young ones. The young ladies who are becoming women and who will soon bear children, I pray. You know, Jesus loved the church and as a covenant, not a contract. As a covenant and not a contract. Ephesians chapter 5, once again, please. You know, and, it, and it's really difficult sometimes to show our feelings or even discuss our feelings with our wives, you know. Uh, we men are, are men of few words. Okay? Because we men think with our heads and the women, they think with their hearts. And sometimes we just don't know what you're feeling, so you need to tell us. We need to communicate. And men, yeah, we need to do that too. It's hard. It's tough for us to do that. Yeah. You know? But, you know, the Word says, and these are the words of Paul. <coughs> Let's go to verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 5. And this is a very, very important part of our relationships. Whether it be with friends, family, wives, husbands, your neighbors, whether you like them or not. <laughs> it's okay, buddy. Verse 15. See then you walk circumspectly. That's carefully. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So in other words, do not be filled with the spirits of the wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms, 
and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. To the Lord. Everything goes to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. You know, in Philippians 2, 1 through 8, there's a similar thing in there, you know. And we call that the kenosis passage. And it says something like this, to esteem others better than yourself. To lift one another up. To humble yourself and give of yourself as Jesus gave it all, even to the point of the cross. You can write that down, Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 8. And 5 through 8 is the Kenosis passage where he gave up his deity and became a man. Can we give up our pride and become the man that Jesus became? And do and walk as Jesus walked. He became a man and did it and showed us that we can do the same thing if we follow him and we give him all that we have and all that we are in our relationships with our Friends and family, fathers and mothers and wives. Jesus kept his promise. Jesus continues to keep his covenant. Continues. And as we study before in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is, is here and not yet. The kingdom of God is here because Jesus came and he demonstrated and he was killed, you know, but then rose again. That's part of it. But he said, I will not leave you orphans and I will come back for you. That's his promise. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end and I am coming quickly. We sang a song today that was just uplifting for me because there's a promise in there. And if we, re and we see that song there, we can go back to the Word and we can pick it out of the Word. Jesus loves you. I love you all. And I pray that we can love one another as Christ loves the church. Hmm. Relationships. What is your relationship with your loved ones? But most of all, what is your relationship with the Almighty? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we do thank you that you love us. That you've loved us so much that you laid down your life freely for us. And the greatest part about it is that you rose from the dead and in a sense defeated death, that power and penalty of sin. And I pray in the name of Jesus right now, if any of us in here have any business to do with God, that we bring it before Him. So as this, this song is presented to our Lord, I would have you think about your relationship with Him, with one to another with your mother. In Jesus' name, amen.